Right, hello there. Um, I just want to introduce this new project of mine, which is a sort of series of very short videos. These will be no longer than 20 minutes, really, at the most, in which I will try to summarize the results of new papers of mine, specifically in the field of comparative psychology, which is the study of cognition in animals, basically. So there's going to be no discussion of human behavior and evolution. Only animal comparative cognitive psychology is going to be uh, discussed on this channel. I'll try to produce uh, more of these videos. Um, hopefully you enjoy this one. And if I have the time, I, I'll, I'll put out another one maybe in another week or so. But let's, let's uh, play it by ear, shall we? Okay, so this one is going to be about a new paper of mine on possible tactical deception in a type of parrot called the Kia, uh, Nestor notabilis. So what's tactical deception? Well, there are two kinds of tactical deception. So let's start off with the first kind. The first kind of tactical deception involves the acquisition of, say, warning coloration that you can use to deceive a potential predator into thinking that you're toxic when in fact you're not. So a good example of this would be something like the hoverfly, which you can see in the insect panel up there, which is on the bottom left-hand side, which has evolved to look a lot like the wasp, which is in the top right-hand side. And the idea is, is that the hoverfly is harmless, but by virtue of having the same warning coloration as the wasp, the hoverfly nevertheless benefits from the uh, avoidant, from the fact that predators will tend to avoid it thinking it is a wasp. So it benefits from what are called type 1 errors or false positive errors. So this is a form of passive tactical deception. The, the insect doesn't need to really do anything other than just look like a more venomous insect in order to benefit from this form of deception. The form we're more interested in is active tactical deception. And this is a more higher level cognitive form of social intelligence, which involves the ability to intentionally deceive others by manipulating their behavior. And this is the critical part is intentionally, because in order to engage in tactical deception, you have to be able to some extent to be able to model the agency of other people. And once you've built a sort of mental model or mental representation of their behavior, you can then develop manipulative tactics in order to get them to do what you want them to do. So it's a higher level process. Now, this form of tactical deception can be studied experimentally, and indeed it has, especially in chimpanzees and other great apes. Probably the most famous paper on this topic is Witten and Byrne, 1988, and they devised a series of experiments which they use to demonstrate fairly conclusively that tactical deception actually operates within chimpanzees. And these were quite clever. These involved things like uh, the chimpanzee and, and an experimenter essentially competing for a piece of food which had been placed in the center of a room and there were various partitions and things and the chimps could go behind the partitions in order to deceive the experimenter about their location and they could sort of bolt out from behind the partition, grab the food and be off. So this was quite conclusive. It's also been studied in other animals as well. For example, ravens are known to be active tactical de deceivers rather in the sense that they will cache fake food. They will actually take stones and things and they will cache them and they'll do so in a way that's very conspicuous to other ravens which will cause the other ravens to think that that cache is actually food. And in reality, what's happened is that raven has already cached its food. It did it out of sight, out of sight of the others. Um, so it's deceiving the competitors into the location of a true cache by putting out a decoy cache that contains nothing but, but uh, stones or what have you. So this has actually been studied in ravens. Uh, another species in which it's present, another species of birds, are plovers. And these are, these are quite interesting because what they do is they feign wing injuries when predators are close to the nest. And by feigning a, a wing injury, what the predators will do is they will go for the plover feigning a wing injury rather than the nest. And the, uh, this process has some plasticity, so the, the, the plovers can sort of intensify the apparent severity of the injury based on the number of predators and their proximity to nests, etc. So again, the plovers are trying to tactically deceive the predators in this instance. 
And of course, humans engage in tactical deception. A rather amusing example of this is, uh, posted, is, is presented there in the bottom, uh, the bottom image. Um, and this is a case from World War II where uh, the Allies created inflatable tanks, which they would sort of pepper over airfields and other strategic sites in order to convince the enemies to um, drop their bombs or deplete their ammunition, taking out these inflatable tanks, which of course left the real tanks unharmed. Uh, and of course the idea is that the humans doing this are trying to tactically, tactically deceive the enemy humans into thinking that a fake target is a real target. So I just thought I'd include that as a fairly good example. We're most definitely tactical deceivers, which is something we seem to have in common with the other uh, higher apes. Um, now, what is a Kia? Well, it's a kind of alpine parrot. It's called an alpine parrot because they live up in the southern Alps on the South Island of New Zealand. Um, they are very ancient. They belong to a, a group of parrots called the Strigopodiae, uh, all of which live in New Zealand, and all of which broke off from the other parrots many millions of years ago. Um, so they haven't shared common ancestry with other parrots for a, a very long time. And as a result of that, all of the members of this grouping have, a, have various sort of unusual characteristics and features. And the Kia is unusual in the sense that it's cold tolerant, it has adaptations to the cold, which you don't find in other parrots, which tend to be uh, more uh, tropical or subtropical. Uh, it has thick feathers, for example, they have long legs and they move with like a hop and a bound, they can sort of jump through the snow essentially. Um, they don't waddle like other parrots do. And they're also extraordinarily intelligent. And they're used as a model organism in the study of certain forms of this extraordinary intelligence as well, like physical cognition, where they have been found to be capable of what's called probabilistic reasoning. This is the ability to work out what the most likely outcome in a sequence is based on stochastically sampling prior iterations of that sequence. Um, they can then make a sort of judgment as to whether the reward is more likely to be associated with the sequence a or sequence B or what have you, um, based on the relative frequencies of events. And they also seem to be able to engage in improvisational tool use. There's one good example of this is a Kia in a New Zealand um, zoological park, which has no upper mandible. So it's had to improvise a self uh, a self caring innovation. And this takes the form of a stone that it picks up and holds between its lower mandible and its tongue, and it sort of runs its feathers through the stone and the tongue, making up for the lack of an upper mandible, which allows it to preen and self-care and sort of get rid of parasites and dead feathers and dandruff and stuff um, without you know, having, we're basically compensating for a disability. So this is again a very unusual behavior, uh, even among parrots, which are very sparp, this is very unusual. Now, they were not liked historically in New Zealand, and were, they were actually persecuted quite vigorously, really starting in the 1800s, when it was observed that they would occasionally attack sheep, uh, particularly elderly or very young or infirmed sheep, and they would often strike the sheep in such a way that they would target the fat around the kidneys. Now, given that they evolve in a very cold environment, which is quite resource poor, especially during the winter, um, this behavior is, is a logical behavior because sheep fat is gonna be very highly nutritious. It's gonna be rich in readily metabolizable carbohydrates and things, and they're going to be able to, to use that quite effectively. The problem is it annoyed the sheep farmers who were losing not many, but some sheep to this thing. And this led to a bit of a, a sort of mania in persecuting them where there were bounties put on them and there, there was a lot of money coming from the New Zealand government uh, going into these sort of corporations that were managing bounties. And ultimately this led to the population crashing from what was probably hundreds of thousands to begin with to around 5,000 today. So they're quite rare, although the populations in New Zealand are, as I understand it, relatively stable. They're not showing, sign of it, not showing signs of any further decline. And they seem to also thrive in captivity as well. There's quite a lot of successful cases of captive breeding these parrots in private collections or zoological collections outside of New Zealand. So they're, they're not in any danger of going extinct or anything. 
But what I thought was most a most interesting oversight about this species of parrot is despite the fact many aspects of its intelligence are well characterized uh, experimentally and ethologically, nobody has ever really looked for evidence of tactical deception. And this brings me to what I call the, the Fowler case. Um, and this is after Molly Fowler, who was the wife of a very famous New Zealand naturalist, Sir Robert Fowler. Uh, she was given a pet Kia by her husband, who retrieved it from a burrow. It had been abandoned, and had it been left there, it would have died. So he sort of hoiked it out and gave it to her as a pet in around 1948. And in 1974, she wrote a book about her experiences with this bird. And sadly, the bird didn't last very long. It only lasted about five months. And poisoning was one of the sort of candidate causes. Uh, it would have made sense being the 1970s. The Kia was not fully protected until the 1980s. So people were probably leaving poison baits out. And it's possible the bird came into contact with one of those and died. It was a sort of free range bird. It was allowed to come and go as it pleased. It wasn't confined to an aviary or anything. So basically, uh, in this book, which is really written for a sort of younger audience, um, she, she presents a number of sort of heavily stylized and imaginative uh, and anthropomorphized accounts of the bird's behavior, which are there to sort of enlighten the reverie of the, uh, of the whole experience of reading the book. It was never written as a scientific work, but it was, it was written as a sort of a like a, a literary biographical thing targeting a young audience. But nevertheless, some of the material contained therein is potentially very interesting and possibly even revealing of some of these sort of higher level forms of social cognition. So one of the anecdote which stood out to my mind was this one, which I'll read in full. One morning, Bob, that's her husband, Sir Robert Fanner, accidentally trod on his foot. Mr. Key's reaction was most vociferous. After being caressed and comforted, however, he apparently quite forgot about the sore foot, such as a child might have done when it has been kissed and made better. That evening, he began to run as usual to the door to welcome his master home. Suddenly, a few feet from the door, he pulled up and scowled at Bob, and lifting one foot, came limping back to me. As he had shown no sign whatever of limping during the day, the family's mirth was prodigious, it became more so when we realized that he was holding up the wrong foot. So why is this important? I believe, and apparently so did the peer reviewers of my paper, that what Molly Fowler might have been describing there, albeit in a somewhat embellished and anthropomorphic way, is an instance of tactical deception. So let's break this down a bit. The bird seems to be manipulating Molly. And in this instance, it's doing so by feigning an injury from Bob. Now, bearing in mind, Bob did tread on the poor thing's foot, so it was injured at one point. But the bird was known to be a repeat offender. In subsequent encounters with Bob, the bird would present with an injured foot, even after the injury had healed. But it would do so in the presence of Molly. So one thing that this suggests is that the bird was in this case tactically deceiving Molly about having an injury in such a way so as to manipulate Molly into giving the bird more attention. And the sort of sequence of events seems to support that logic. Now, I will qualify what I have just said with the following observation, which for those of you who are interested in comparative psychology and ethology is something you have to keep in mind. In order to check the excesses of the ethologist's imagination, there is a concept that we use called Morgan's Canon, and it's a kind of parsimony rule when used to construct narratives or provide explanations of aspects of animal behavior. And the rule goes like this. It is better to use simple explanations than more complex ones. So whilst it could be the case that this bird was engaging in agent-based reasoning and was engaging in a strategic sort of deployment of behaviors in such a way so as to produce this deceptive representation in order to attract attention, it may also be the case 
that somehow this foot lifting behavior became contingently reinforced with, um, uh, with, with, uh, uh, with, with the presence of Bob, who had inflicted this injury unintentionally, obviously, on the bird initially. So the foot lifting behavior could have, could have just been a sort of contingent thing. The bird got its foot, got its foot trodden on, um, it got a lot of attention, and whenever it saw Bob, it kind of triggered like an associative reflex, and the bird just started lifting its foot again. Um, so that's another possibility. Now that, of course, wouldn't require a more elaborate cognitive schemata, but I would say that even though that explanation is more uh, congruent with Morgan's canon, I would argue that there are other aspects of the social ecology of Kia which lend themselves to the idea that this might actually have been the real deal. It might have been a real example of tactical de de deception. A good example of this is social cooperation. Kia are known to be not just extremely efficient social cooperators, but very good social learners as well. And indeed, this was part of a problem with Kia historically in New Zealand, because they would, but one of the ways they would um, spread this behavior of attacking sheep is through social learning. And what the, what the shepherds found was if you, if you removed or you know, neutralized the Kia that was teaching the others to do this, it would break up the chain of social learning and the other Kia wouldn't wouldn't do this, right? It would break up the chain of social learning, they'd have fewer opportunities to socially learn the behavior, and as a result, the Kia in this sort of environ, the surrounding environ, would be relatively well behaved. So they're very good at social cooperate, cooperative social learning. And it is thought that this aspect of social cognition is very strongly and intimately linked evolutionarily to tactical deception. There's a good paper on this by McNally and Jackson, which came out in 2013 in, I believe, it was Proceedings of a Royal Society B, which explores these connections in more depth. So given that Kia are known to be very effective social cooperators and social learners, it stands to reason that the sort of selection pressures that might have brought about or formed those aspects of their behavior may also have favored the evolution of tactical deception. So we have a sort of evolutionarily plausible narrative, essentially, what you could call a plausible just-so story huh, to explain the, uh, uh, an adaptive historical narrative, rather, that might explain the, um, uh, the origin of this behavior in Kia. And again, there are other highly intelligent birds, in particular the ravens, which are also known tactical deceivers. And they, they really do use tactical deception to great effect in terms of, uh, as I mentioned, um, reducing competition over caching sites and things. So if it evolved once in one highly intelligent taxon, why could it not have evolved again in another highly intelligent taxon? The observation, whilst extremely interesting, and indeed it got me a publication, desperately needs to be followed up experimentally, however, and I will leave, I will really sort of end the presentation on, on this uh, particular slide, and I'll, I'll just elaborate further. I believe I have found other instances of tactical deception in Kia. On the site Reddit, there are a number of posts on Kia which are littered with anecdotes that I've actually saved of people reporting Kia cooperating to deceive hikers by clowning around in front of them whilst another one sneaks up behind them and grabs something from a backpack. And there's actually quite a few instances of this behavior. Now, of course, it's not made in any kind of ethologically sound context, but again, anecdotes such as that can be indicative as to the existence of a more sort of robust behavior, which is being largely overlooked. And then there's this, which is a still, I've sort of combined two images from a, a still, um, from, well, two still images rather, from, from, a, from a, a 1972 documentary on Kia called The Prince of Nosy Parkers, which shows a very, very interesting behavior. So the Kia on the right 
is tugging at the man's jacket. You can see the man there in the middle, he's sort of reclining. He's changed position a little bit between the shots, but the, 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 the orientation is more or less conserved. So the relative location of the birds is, 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 is there. If the camera pans across the man, you can see the birds are where they are, basically. Now, he's playing, clearly, with the two Kia who are immediately in front of him. So those are the ones on the left-hand side of the image. Notice there are two. I think there's another one off, off camera as well. But they're sort of engaging with him at the front. Now, Kia are very hierarchical. They have a real pecking order. And the bird which gets to sort of explore the novelty or interact with the, the, you know, the, the novelty in the environment is typically the more dominant bird. The other birds have to sort of stand back and uh, wait their turn. And this is fairly normal for, for Kia. They're, they're quite sort of rigor, you know, rigidly hierarchical like that. Now, what's happening is, what you can see the bird is approaching him and is playing with whatever that is he has in his hand. I think it's a little bit of paper or something. The other one is sort of standing there, waiting its turn in full view of the dominant bird. But then there's this sneaky one who's going up behind the man and who is tugging on his jacket. Now, what might he be trying to do? Well, one possibility is he's trying to do tactical deception. Because what he's doing is he's trying to get the man's attention whilst remaining out of sight of the other Kia. So in other words, he is, he's trying to signal to the man that he'd like attention, he'd like a little bit of whatever it is he's giving to the ones at the front, but he's not prepared to openly compete with the other Kia for that thing, that reward. So he's hoping that the man is just going to give him a, you know, a sneaky sneaky bit of whatever it is on the side. And this is very clever because this suggests that the Kia to the right, one behind the man, is trying to tactically deceive the other Kia by going out of sight. And in so doing, um, he's, trying to, uh, he's trying to get the man to give him whatever he's giving them without having to actually openly compete. Because it's possible that Kia is, has a very low status in the sort of Kia pecking order, the Kia um, uh, uh, hierarchy. So that might be why that bird is, is resorting to that, to, to, to that sort of uh, um, deceptive behavior. Now, the other thing that's interesting about this anecdote is it's not just that I spotted this in this rather obscure and old documentary, which I will link to in the show notes so you can actually watch it yourself. It's quite good fun, actually. It's a bit psychedelic, but it's, it's actually very good fun. It's because I encountered this behavior before. In media interviews given by a researcher at the Animal Minds Lab at the University of Auckland, when in the course of the interview, the researcher actually uh, noted this behavior and said, well, if you're sort of lying down on the ground with the birds and playing with them, you'll always get the odd one that'll come up behind you and tug at you and try to sort of, you know, get you to give them a bit of behavior, uh, sorry, a bit of attention rather, and they'll do it in a sly way that's out of sight of the other Kia. Again, my opinion, this is like classical tactical deception. <laughs> and this behavior hasn't just been noted once in that context. I've found this instance of it as well. It's gone wholly uncommented on in the scientific literature. So people, I think, really need to pay attention to this. As I, I think this is where Kiaology, for want of a better term, needs to go. It needs to really focus on trying to better understand this aspect of social and, and, and tactical cognition, because this is, this is, I think there are some really interesting things going on here, which are, which are just sort of, uh, going below the radar of a lot of these research groups that focus on Kia. Oh, and Animal Minds, by the way, is really good. They have a super duper channel. I will link to that channel in the show notes. Go over there, give their videos likes, um, sign up to their channel, whatever it is you do, watch their stuff. It's really good. They have some really solid, interesting things. You can see a lot of the experiments that I talk about, like probabilistic reasoning actually being done in real time on the birds. So you can watch all that being done. Anyway, Thank you for watching, and until next time, I will, uh, I will see you, yes, I'll see you next time.